cost model that is uh, in growing use by utilities to, uh, to uh, plan the build out of their system and look at how the system is operated, often on a sub hourly basis. But once we input the 2050 system that had 80% renewables in it into the Plexus model, uh, we were able to run that system in the model for the entire year on an hourly basis. So we, we looked at the, uh, the, the projected 2050 demand hour by hour uh, over the course of the year. And uh, Plexo's model then tells us what the least cost dispatch of the existing generators is to meet that demand. And um, uh, as, as uh, the video showed here, there were several things that, that are, are kind of interesting in looking at the, uh, the, the size of the colored uh, circles uh, grow and shrink as production increases and decreases. You can see the sun move from east to west and the solar plants uh, firing up. And when the solar plants and the wind plants are running uh, full on, you can see uh, the, the fossil um, generators turn down. Uh, but the, the key uh, takeaway here is, is that we, uh, according to the Plexos model, again, a model that's used by, by current utilities, um, this system can be operated. Um, if you drop these, uh, an important point to make though, is if you drop these, uh, if you were to drop these technologies into the existing system with no other changes, it wouldn't be operated. You could not operate that system. But with, uh, uh, with a number of changes to increase flexibility, which I'm going to talk about in a little more detail in a moment, uh, changes in, in operational strategies, uh, changes in, uh, in regu the regulatory uh, requirements of operating power systems in the US, you can operate the system. So, um, while we look at, at, at future scenarios for, uh, for expanding um, renewables around the world, uh, there are many countries that are making this happen already. A lot of countries have started uh, very aggressive programs. You see some of them scrolling across the screen here. Denmark at 100% by 2035. Germany uh, project are planning very high penetrations. Hawaii, a state in the US that is, uh, has been a, a very good partner with us in looking at uh, uh, at, at real life challenges of putting high uh, high levels of solar on the system, uh, so these uh, uh, these uh, deployments are, are happening. Um, they're happening, and their uh, aggressive plans are in place by a, a number of, of places. So I want to uh, I want to dig uh, in a little bit deeper about exactly what it means to have high levels of renewables. Uh, I put up a couple of charts here from a study that we did looking at the Western uh, interconnection in the U.S. The U.S. basically has uh, uh, three synchronous power systems. Um, the Western uh, interconnection, which this study covered, the Eastern interconnection, and then uh, Texas, for whatever reason, is its own, uh, is its own interconnection. And uh, uh, so in the West, uh, we looked at uh, a scenario where we had a 35% penetration of wind and solar. And if you look at the, uh, this so-called dispatch stack on the left, uh, this is the scenario uh, for the way demand is met cost effectively in a, with, if there were no wind and solar in the system. So you can see that uh, a, a few unique characteristics you see uh, 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 very much periodicity in, in the load profile uh, across, uh, this is across one week in a uh, week in April. Uh, you see that the, the nuclear generators in the black at the bottom and the coal generators run kind of flat out. That's the way um, utility operators are accustomed to running. Uh, with uh, combined uh, cycle gas meeting much of the demand. And in the west, the peaks are met typically by hydro, the purple at the top. Uh, so this is a very orderly way to, to run a utility system. It's the way utilities are accustomed to operating and meeting demand. Uh, so uh, we, we did this study. Actually, we, we modeled the, the entire power system in the West hour by hour over a three-year period. And uh, I, I've chosen this chart on the right because this is the most challenging week of the three years. It's a period where uh, overall demand is low, but the wind is blowing. And there's also a lot of sunshine. It's the spring springtime in the West, and uh, uh, 
So if you have the same week in April that was mo that was modeled here, but uh, with uh, with 35% wind and solar. And you can see uh, this is a very different scenario uh, for utility operators. Uh, a couple of things I'll just point out very quickly. The most obvious one is that uh, now instead of coal running flat out the way it does in a, in a no wind and solar scenario, you see uh, very many uh, and sharp ramps up and down that you have to move the fossil generators around. This is uh, not how they're accustomed to being operated, but when we model the system, we model in great detail all the characteristics of not only the solar uh, not only the solar and wind, but the fossil generator. So uh, this is a feasible way to run these generators. It's within their operate, operating regime to ramp at these rates. So you can operate the system um, from an engineering perspective, again, with some of the changes uh, introducing more flexibility into the system. The other, uh, the other issue that's always intrigued me about this kind of transformation and the fact that it's uh, there are costs embedded in this kind of transformation. As you can see, that uh, this combined cycle gas that is used over here to generate and meet much of the demand is completely displaced in this case. So uh, for these uh, generators that have been invested in and there's return expected, uh, there are impacts on those generators, as well as the physical impacts imposed by cycling. So I'll wrap up here by just concluding that, and saying that, uh, as I've mentioned a couple of times, that uh, one of the common themes in all of these studies that we do is that to be able to accommodate increasing amounts of renewable power, the variable generators especially, wind and solar, um, is uh, we, we have to have more flexibility. Uh, as you can see in the left, Utility operators are already accustomed to variability and uncertainty. There's variability and uncertainty in the load. But why this is very different, of course, is that we're introducing variability and uncertainty in the supply. So a number of, uh, there are a number of flexibility strategies on both the demand side and the supply side that uh, these studies point to. Uh, part of the purpose of these studies is to help us uh, begin to uh, begin to ask the right questions. What do we need to do? What do we need to consider to be able to affordably operate a system with high penetrations of renewables? You can see that these are, uh, this is a notional graph here. Uh, there are some uh, flexibility strategies that are lower costs and you can deploy these at lower penetrations. Uh, uh, the supply and, and reserve sharing, for example, are, are balancing expansion of the geographic area where you're uh, balancing load and generation. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, of uh, flexible demand possibility, and you can imagine not only in, in uh, flexible loads, but uh, the electrification of transportation. Uh, and uh, have up here for highest penetrations, uh, because uh, currently it's the most costly flexibility strategy. And you can see it also sort of straddles the supply side and the demand side line is storage. And uh, storage, uh, of, of course, uh, offers both a flexible supply and a flexible load, but currently at a, at a great cost. So many of these, uh, uh, many of these uh, studies are pointing to the same uh, conclusion that high penetration power systems are feasible, uh, that, that we can achieve these levels, uh, these very high levels of penetration make significant impact on uh, the carbon profile of the power system, uh, but we have to change the way we're doing business and operating and uh, regulating power systems to be able to achieve that. Thank you very much for your attention. Really appreciate it. Also to David Mooney now I would like the three panelists to come up to the podium. We have some time left for discussion. I think all three showed us very different pictures about uh, desperately needed answers to some issues in terms of decarbonizing the energy economy, in uh, terms of making renewables, volatile renewables, happen at high shares where batteries are a key enabler. And so there are some common themes as well. And one seems to be the diffusion of innovation and whether we can expect radical or incremental innovation and how much that costs 
what does it mean for the mix overall, what are the first solutions to go for, and overall we have a co-evolution of systems. We have a co-evolution between societal needs, individual needs, between the economic economy and their drivers, but also what the environment needs us to obey. Uh, and we have technological change as a further driving factor. Uh, I was very impressed by a statement that uh, Yoshino san made in one of in, in his interviews, and he said, well, the best of my ideas, I always have in a relaxed environment, not when I think very hard. And that's the key for innovation and the recipe. Um, and maybe the first question uh, I would like to address to Yoshino san uh, you know, the question is, what is needed and, and, and what is likely for the future? Batteries seem to be a key technology for the energy revolution. You said in one of the interviews this will be the next revolution that we see after the IT revolution that started in the 90s. Um, batteries, especially lithium technology based batteries are, are seem to be the key, uh, one key. And what is your opinion about the needs where do we see most pro progress? And what is the likely future that you see? The needs. Mm -hmm. Where do we need development? Sometimes I show a slide where we have different layers. What is the material, science layer, components development? I think you are in that sphere. Then we have systems. I look at Jean with process technologies that are from cradle to grave, from chimney to uh, the mines. And we have the upper plane, which is the market policy society plane. Yeah. And on all those planes, we have needs. And we have some expectations or some views what will happen. So my question is, where do you see the most needs for a sustainable energy tra transition? <laughs> For progress. Okay, uh, my, my private opinion is uh, uh, it is very important. Uh, the, uh, one is social grid. Also, the second important uh, is uh, private grid. So the uh, this is uh, balance of this uh, social grid and uh, private grid. Uh, ideally, the, both uh, also the social media is very uh, high, also the private community is high. <laughs> uh, for example, in case of the solar energy systems, uh, social media is very, very high, I think. But the uh, private uh, private uh, is uh, not so high because of the high price of this. So the, we should uh, improve the technology uh, to realize the balance of this uh, uh, two points. And uh, from my uh, point of view, so in case of the solar energy system, it is very important to uh, electricity strike system. But unfortunately, the addition of iron battery is not so cheap for this uh, application. And uh, I think the uh, uh, price should be uh, be lower than uh, half. If uh, this price is realized, the uh, uh, combination of solar system and the uh, battery storage system is uh, uh, will be uh, realized.
today we have some vaginal line as being very expensive. But that's not a surprise. It's first of kind, very small numbers of these plants. Um, and so you need more of them. You need to put on a learning curve, as you've seen with renewables and you've seen with battery technologies. And uh, you know, I sometimes feel like we're a broken record. And, and a lot of people in the CCS space say that you need to have you know, sort of policies that drive that forward. So it's almost at that top level, you need to have some kind that give you innovation, that give you cost reduction, that can, that can create markets okay, for these technologies. And so that's what I, I think, from my perspective, is, is very much needed. Now that being said, I think there's some really interesting issues around um, how future energy systems will drive innovation and drive future, future uh, CCS technology development. Because we saw a great slide that, that, that looking at you know, 35% just a 35% of renewable scenario. If that's where the top level direction is going, and that's certainly where it's going in many countries, uh, leaving the economics, leaving the, you know, the decisions aside about that, that's, the, the, that's what people seem to want in those countries. It also means that you're going to need technologies, uh, also technologies, based on generator. Maybe there are some such things based on you need these sort of generation technologies that are complementary. And the CCS technologies we have today aren't that complementary uh, because they're very capital intensive. And so there's needs to, the, the, the changes in the energy system are going to drive these uh, needs for innovation and, 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 and new technology. Well, maybe you know some of our studies we did on CCS, and we showed consistently that the fusion of CCS is more likely at current prices of 60 euros or dollars and beyond. We did a CCS diffusion study for Europe showing also very slow diffusion, if at all, learning curves start when diffusion processes start because the technology on the shelf is not as useful as it, it penetrates the market. So in, in, the, in that sense, do you see a fast diffusion? Do you, do you see much higher carbon prices? You, you made the point that policy is needed, but what kind of policy? Command and control, CCS is an obligation, or get the carbon prices right? Um, well, the, I mean, so I think the, the IEA top level message is around, is about having carbon price, right? The, the most economic efficient way of doing this. But um, I think the reality is that for a lot of the technologies, and there's lots of studies that look at this, that carbon pricing isn't going to necessarily drive the innovation you need, and that market force will get, reach all the way back to the innovation chain. Um, and so, um, the way we get, not to mention that in the CCS case, you're right, prices need to get up there. And um, and so I think the way we've been looking at things lately is that you need to have other policies that can create uh, basically niche markets for this technology that you continue to learn and you continue to drive things down and get more of these plans. So if you look at things that are being developed today, there's a lot of you can come with enhanced water recovery. Um, some people on the climate perspective Reducing fossil fuel use, that makes them a bit nervous, but that's a great revenue stream that can help support some of these projects that don't great. Um, and, and, and there may be others, the industrial applications, gas processing, doing more of that, and that will really help on the storage and, and talk about storage, but that will help on the storage. Yeah. So there's opportunities like that, and there's niches where they can grow. Well, we know that learning curves can sometimes point upwards as well, you know, with material scarcity, maybe some of the components or materials needed for battery solutions um, and also security uh, increased uh, obligations to increase security if you compare nuclear power learning curves they look different in Europe, in US and Asia and the same could be expected for CCS technology and so we could try to bet on learning curves but it's not a guarantee that you always point downwards and uh, also, uh, Yoshina san showed us a curve that was all but you know, monotonic, <laughs> mon monotonic uh, decreasing. Now, David, uh, high penetration of volatile renewables, is that a hobby or is it more? Well, I, uh, you probably won't be surprised uh, to, to learn that I, I was not in agreement with the assertion at the opening session that, that uh, renewables are a hobby. Um, I think uh, we, 
we have uh, definitely crossed the threshold in, uh, to this being uh, a substantial uh, industry. I think uh, renewables are, are going to be a very significant part of uh, uh, future power generation. Um, it's, uh, as Sean pointed out, it's, uh, and as I showed in some of my slides, countries are moving in this direction, uh, uh, partly out of uh, commitment to decarbonization, but uh, there's uh, very much a, a popular uh, desire for, for these technologies. I would say a, a few things. Uh, we should uh, make no mistake that I, I think wind and solar are where they are today because of, of policy. Um, if, uh, if strong policies had not been put in place, in many cases mandates, uh, uh, we would not uh, we would not have enjoyed the learning curves we've seen in, in wind and solar specifically. Um, our uh, currently uh, President Obama talks a lot about uh, all of the above energy strategy, and, and my personal belief is we have to approach it that way. Uh, we're trying to introduce these technologies into a legacy system that is uh, <coughs> over a hundred years old. Uh, the conventional generators are are not going to be immediately displaced. We have to integrate uh, with the conventional generators and uh, solutions such as uh, carbon capture and sequestration, I think can uh, be a very important uh, component as well as uh, as batteries to uh, help accommodate the need of flexibility. Yeah, thanks. There's something called path dependence. So policymakers have this problem that whatever policy they design and implement, they create or even maintain some path dependence um, that calls for some energy economics analysis and optimal R&D for energy technologies. So how would you go about such a topic? Well, one of the, uh, one of the things that we, we found in doing sensitivities in, in our studies that one of the most powerful levers still remaining for, uh, uh, for uh, enabling this transformation in a cost-effective and an economic way is to continue to improve the performance, uh, reliability, and the manufacturing cost of wind and solar. Uh, still, uh, even though they've come down quite a bit, there, uh, our analysis shows there is room for continued improvement, and uh, that is one of the most impactful things that we can continue to do is that needed R&D. Uh, coupled with the, the learning that is uh, uh, happening and through increased production and, uh, and the uh, maturing of the supply chains necessary for production. Okay, thanks. We have a few minutes left for public discussion. I see two questions already. Yes, please. Yeah, we have a microphone. Oh, yeah. Um, your job is the Bureau of Economic Geology is here often. Uh, the question is to David. We do a lot of electricity system modeling as well. Uh -huh. So far, we have not mostly an independent grid, square paths, or square paths, yeah. some other modeling. In our modeling cases, unless we have heroic assumptions about cost reductions, more wind, and so on and so forth, the model doesn't build anything. Yeah, very little wind, very little salt. So, my question to your model, I guess, what kind of assumptions do you have in terms of post reduction? And then the other question is more specific to the April week that you showed in your modeling. Yes. One thing I noticed in your 35% wind and solar case, the total demand is not met. Mm -hmm. The total amount in both jobs were not the same. So, I didn't understand that how that happens. And I guess one related question. Yes, you can technologically have, I guess, 35% wind, solar, or whatever you want, but it is also economically more efficient. Related question, yes, you can cycle the coal plants, and apparently you're not building any combined cycle in that case, but if you're cycling those coal plants, do you think that the owners of those plants are going to keep those plants open if they're not running at a certain capacity factor? That is part of the economic question. Is that clear? I said a lot of things, but the question no, I, I think you did say a lot of things, and uh, it's uh, maybe uh, an hour to respond, actually. Yeah. Well, we can talk separately, but I think everybody... No, that would be... Uh, maybe, perhaps we should, but uh, uh, 
uh, starting with uh, our cost projections is that uh, we do have uh, cost projections out to whatever period we're modeling. And in the Western Wind and Solar case, uh, we were at that time we uh, modeled the system as if it were 2017. We started that work in 2012. Uh, and we publish all of, all of our cost assumptions are published. Uh, we are moving in a direction though uh, of uh, uh, doing something we call the uh, annual technology baseline, which is uh, uh, which is a publicly available set of uh, cost and performance and reliability assumptions that we're going to use in all of our studies. Uh, we, we've had uh, one of the challenges we've had is. Uh, is assumptions uh, varying from analysis to analysis, but now we're going to have the annual technology baseline so that we, uh, all of our analysts are, are using that same uh, set of assumptions going forward. So you can actually look on the web to see uh, to see exactly what assumptions we use. But we, um, uh, I, I understand the kind of analysis that you're talking about and seeing uh, in sort of an organic uh, economic environment what uh, capacity expansion models tell you what will be built. But we constrain uh, intentionally our capacity expansion model to build out renewables because we want to see what a system would look like uh, if it builds out those renewables. I mean, we look at the cost, we, we, within the constraints that we impose, we look at the least cost, um, uh, the least cost path, uh, and we do that with, the, with those assumptions. Uh, going to the question of, um, of demand being met, that uh, a nuance, uh, it's not a nuance actually, it's, a, it's sort of a core part of the study, is that uh, the 35% penetration is for something called the West Connect footprint in the Western interconnection. It's the five states of uh, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, Wyoming. Um, and uh, but we model the entire interconnection, so when it looks like demand is not being met, actually uh, it is being met, but there, there is power being traded back and forth between the West Connect and the rest of the Western interconnection. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ihan Orr from Wallace University. I would like to thank the panel, first of all, for a very interesting overview of new technologies. Uh, I have two questions, one to Dr. McCoy and one to Dr. Mooney. Uh, and my question to Dr. Mooney will be kind of similar to what Professor Gurjan uh, Gulen asked, but it will be more specific. Uh, how are the idle power plants handled in your model? That is, how are they compensated in your model, if they are? And uh, if you don't mind, let me ask my second question also to Dr. McCoy, uh, how costly or difficult is this retrofit business to existing plants? And are there any economies of scale involved? What that means, what I mean by that is that any particular generation power plant size where this uh, implementation would be economically more feasible. And one final thing, how about deployment in high energy use technologies? Like iron and steel or cement or something like that. Okay, thank you very much. Shall I go? Uh, the, uh, the, the plants, the conventional thermal units are, uh, uh, are handled uh, in a way that they, they are uh, turned down to their minimum heat rate. Uh, and, and the model actually curtails wind and solar. If the demand is low enough, uh, the wind and solar are are high enough that the thermal units get turned down. The gas plants get turned off, the coal plants do not get turned off, they get turned down to a minimum uh, heat rate. Uh, in, in, in our production cost model, they're, they're not compensated. And this is, uh, this is a little bit of the point I was alluding to with uh, the displacement of the combined cycle gas plants. Uh, there are uh, very real issues here associated with uh, the suppression of of uh, uh, prices in, in the markets in the east, especially locational market where prices can uh, sometimes go to zero uh, or lower when, uh, when there's very high wind uh, or solar on the system. And uh, so these are, these are some of the issues that are being experienced in real life, but also that our model is indicating. Uh, 
and are important for us to understand and to know uh, what to do to develop solutions. But they, they're not, uh, in, in the model anyway, they're, they're not compensated. Okay, so on, on uh, the couple questions you asked, or three, I guess. The first one about, about uh, I'll start with the scale question. Um, for, for retrofit application of CCS, there isn't, uh, there isn't any theoretical reason you could do it at any scale of a plan, uh, power plant. But um, yeah, you do have a plan to scale in most of this equipment. It's a the chemical processing industry kind of scaling rules that, that show that these things come down. And so uh, when you start to get out a few hundred megawatt scales, um, 500 megawatts somewhere in there, I think you'll start to see the economy scale start to flatten significantly. So the plants we've seen, the first retrofits, I was saying, are quite expensive. And part of the reason they've been quite expensive is because they've been very small scale units. 110 megawatts is key. Um, and you know, when we do our analysis uh, look at issues in China, for example, I mean, I believe uh, this government policy in China that, that you never, those units are just going to retire in small units like that. That you know, you know, they're just subscale. For them. So it's the bigger units that I think are, are more interesting to look at. Uh, in term, and, and also added to that, the, the back end has very strong scale effects. So, so for, for transport and storage. So if you're trying to move, you know, a few hundred thousand tons a year of carbon dioxide, it's very, very expensive unless you have shared infrastructure. So there's a lot of that back end which I didn't talk about. Uh, in terms of uh, the use elsewhere in other sectors, yes. In fact, um, you know, one of the things is we look at, when you look at the way things are moving with, with policy saying, regardless of perhaps the economic implications, I think that's some questions having here about the way the relative merits and costs of things. If you really want to push renewables into the electricity system for whatever reason, you start backing up perhaps fossil fuels, maybe you don't need CCS there, right? But we can't, what, what I, none of my colleagues at the IA and I know how to do is get CCS out of uh, iron, steel, or cement, uh, unless you uh, come up with totally different root formulations of cement or stop using coal, coal in, in steel making and iron making. And so that is really hard to figure. Uh, and so we do see complications there. The costs are all over the place at different because in the industry applications, you have different purities of CO2, different um, sizes of plants. So it's that's a very complicated area to look at. Um, and we do have some work on that, and you essentially see kind of a cost curve of all kinds. And in any even in, 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 in industrial compounds, you will find costs can vary by an order of magnitude uh, between different processes. Uh, just a quick follow-on, if I may, about the uh, about the the thermal plants is that uh, one way that uh, one way that uh, in, in in the real systems on the model, but uh, in the east, their uh, capacity markets are beginning to be introduced, so that uh, uh, that generators are are uh, are paid for being online and, and and being ready to provide capacity as needed and, and high wind penetration. Areas especially, uh, so that they're they're motivated financially to stay turned on and ready to uh, ready to turn up as necessary to provide the capacity to the system. Now, now we're running out of time, and what we try to cover is a very broad spectrum of new technologies coming up, incremental and radical innovation. Radical innovation not being very easy to predict, if at all. And yeah, competing solutions for the energy transition for the coming years needs to be seen whether policymakers get it right and get it right also from an energy economics perspective. We all have our needs and wants and drive the process. That's our individual responsibility and action. Society at large also has a responsibility towards the future generations. And yeah, the industrial players also have their role to play. So it will be interesting also in the years to come, especially when we have uh, more and more innovation driving the process as well. And I think we will not run out, out of work as energy economists. I would like to thank the three panelists today.
and I would like to thank you as well as an audience to be here with us in this early dual plenary session. Uh, I can conclude the dual plenary now and hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.